hello. I was about to give Woody Woodpecker a ride down this pole. <laughs> now I know it isn't everyone that has a woodpecker in the family. So I imagine you'd all like to know how life began for our backwoods Barrymore. Oh, boss, not that again. What I'm about to tell you is actually a true story. At the time it happened, I had a cottage in Sherwood Forest, which is just a short distance from Hollywood. One morning about five, I heard a frantic knocking. I couldn't imagine who'd be calling on us at that hour. Half asleep, I opened the door and looked around. There was nobody there. I thought I'd been hearing things, so I went back to bed. A few minutes later, the knocking started again. This time I knew I wasn't dreaming. I got up and went to the front door again. But I still couldn't see anyone. Now I was completely awake and realized the noise was coming from the roof. And what do you think it was? Yes, it was a big red-headed woodpecker banging at the roof as though his life depended on it. I shouted at him and he flew away. As he left, he gave a crazy sort of a laugh. He not only awakened my wife and me with his early morning serenade, but he was ruining my roof. And do you know why he was doing it? He was drilling hundreds of holes as a storage place for his winter supply of hazelnuts. Here are a few I found. All right, boss. Put him back. That's my old age pension. Hasn't he got a nerve? Now, to get back to my story, I had about as much as I could stand. So I said to my wife, Gracie, this woodpecker has got to go. Sherwood Forest isn't big enough for both of us. I started out the door with my shotgun with the idea of giving this woodpecker a real scare. When Gracie said, don't you know it's against the law to shoot woodpeckers? And anyway, I think he's real cute. Now there's a very intelligent woman. Pipe down, Woody. And furthermore, Gracie said, he's dynamic. He has color. He has personality. And you know you've been talking about a new character for your cartoons. How about a woodpecker? This sounded like a wonderful idea. So I immediately drew a few sketches of woodpeckers. I'd like to show you what my first impressions were. As you can see, there was quite a problem deciding just how Woody should look. I showed the drawings to some of the artists at my studio. They all felt that a wacky woodpecker would make a good character. So we made hundreds of drawings of woodpeckers. They were all sizes and shapes. This one had a long needle nose. One artist thought that he should have a broken bill. These woodpeckers were too fat. This one wasn't bad, but I felt we could improve him. Now tell him how I became a big Hollywood star, boss. Later, Woody, later. Right now, let's get on with the show. Hi there. I'm working on a new character. It's top secret. And I can't show it to you just yet. But, I am going to show you how that lovable bird brain, Woody Woodpecker, was created. Okay, boss. Quit padding your part and tell him about little old lovable me. Now look here, Woody. I don't know where you are. But if you can't keep a civil tongue in your bill, we'll just forget the whole thing. Oh, Mr. Lance, please, sir, you wouldn't. After all, my public has a right to know more about me. All right, Woody, all right. But where are you? Right under your big, uh, I mean, right under your nose, sir. <laughs> well, he's not in here. Or here either. No. I wonder where he is. I'm right here, boss. In the pencil on your drawing board. Ha, ha, ha. 
All right, my fine feathered friend. Let's see what you look like. Let's see, put the eyes in here. And the top knot. Uh-huh. You were in my pencil. You sure had me fooled for a while. Let's see now. A little line here. And a bulge here. And a broken tail. And, of course, a big mouth. look as if I swallowed a balloon. I'm not that fat. Sure, I want to be a big TV star, but not that big. In that case, let's see what we can do for you, Woody. I'll have you reduced in no time. Oh, great. This is just great. Now I ain't got nobody. Oh, don't be so impatient. I'll have you back in shape in a jiffy. There. How do you like that? Muscle Beach, here I come. Now you've got me looking more like a toothpick than a woodpecker. <laughs> well, you're sure hard to please. But let's try it again. I'll bet you wouldn't be satisfied if I made you look like Superman. Just what do you think you should look like? Let me have that pencil and I'll show you. Okay, wise guy. Here. How about your tail feathers? <laughs> wow, what a hand. But that's Woody, and that's how he was created. He gets under your skin at times, but he wouldn't be Woody if he didn't. That's all for now. I'll see you later in the show. You know, I think most of us are interested in how things began. And I believe that's why so many people ask me how Woody Woodpecker became a movie star. Before Woody was born, our big star was Andy Panda. Andy Panda was a cute little fellow. He was always ready to do a good deed. At this time, Woody was completely unknown and we decided to give him a small part in one of Andy Panda's pictures. This is humiliating. I'll have you know I'm a great actor. To be or not to be, that is the question. Well, that takes care of him. We soon realized that we had a real character at our pencil tips. So I went to work with some of the artists in our studio to write a cartoon story in which Woody Woodpecker could be the star. They came up with all sorts of ideas. One fellow thought Woody should be the dashing, adventurous type. Another artist suggested starring him in a western. Like all woodpeckers, I thought Woody should be a little wacky, lovable but fresh, in and out of trouble and causing most of it himself. Homer Brightman came up with an idea for a jungle story. And for one sequence, he suggested that Woody be lost in a swamp. He climbs up on a rock, thinking he is safe, when the rock turns out to be a big, hungry alligator. Oh, no, you don't. I'm not going to start my career on an alligator's empty stomach. Well, the rest of us agreed with Woody on that. And while we were talking, I noticed Alex Lovey was folding a piece of sketching paper into the shape of an airplane. Hey, Walter, 
How about sending Woody on a cross-country flight? What? Without a motor? That's for the birds. Wait a minute. I am a bird. Then the most obvious idea hit me, and I said, uh, Remember how I first discovered Woody when he was drilling holes in my roof? Mm -hmm. Let's do a story on that, Homer. That's a great idea, Walter. Only this time, it'll be Andy Panda's roof. You've got it. After a few days, the boys put together this storyboard for Woody's first picture. The title of his first starring cartoon was Knock Knock. And you're going to have a chance to see it a little later in our show. Did you ever wonder why we generally use animals and birds in our cartoons? In the first place, there's such a variety of them that they offer us many different characters, and we find them interesting. They're usually cute little fellows. For example? All right, Woody. You can be the example. Most of us like fantasy, and some of our favorite stories come from books like Mother Goose, Fairy Tales, Alice in Wonderland, and all the wonderful, well-known children's stories. Now you know how people talk, but how does a rabbit talk, or a penguin, or a buzzard, or a walrus? When we see such creatures talking and acting like people, it seems very funny. Then, too, animal and bird characters like Woody Woodpecker and Andy Panda can be dressed simply and the styles never change. We get fun out of drawing them, and I hope you get a lot of fun out of watching them. I hope you enjoy the cartoon characters talking to each other and the rest of our show today. Hey, boss, you're on. Let's have a little action. All right, Woody. Let's see, um, what shall I do? I have an idea. I'll show our television friends how we draw our characters here at the studio. It's really simpler than you might think. But first, let me show you some pictures by a few young artists who probably draw just about the way you do. Many of Woody's young friends have drawn pictures of him and sent them to me. I think they're wonderful. But most of these young artists are trying too hard. They erase a lot, and sometimes they rub holes right through the paper. The results aren't always good. Oh, boss, they're ruining me. It's murder. Now let me show you a few simple tricks. Here's a circle, and an oval, and a pear shape. and a sort of a hot dog shape. With these simple shapes and a few connecting lines, you can draw almost any character you can think of. To show you how it works, let's start with Woody. First, you draw a circle. Then put two ovals inside it. Two lines make the bill. Then we put in the eyes, the eyebrows, and the mouth. The next thing to do is to add the top knot. Now a few simple outlines make the body. And the arms. the hands, the legs, then we add the feet. A few details give Woody his personality. To give you an idea how important these simple shapes are in making animated cartoons, let's take a quick look around our studio. Here's a director creating a character for one of our cartoons. Notice how he uses the tricks I showed you? 
Here's an animator using the same shapes to rough out his drawings. Do you know that the next cartoon in our show has over 5,000 drawings? Now, perhaps, you'd like to bring Andy Panda to life. Again, we start with a circle. An oval. Then two more ovals for the eyes. Two more for the ears. One for the nose. And a line for the mouth. Finishing touches are easy to add. That's a good idea, Woody. There we have Andy Panda in person. So no matter what you want to draw, remember, you can do it better and quicker if you use the little tricks I've shown you. You know the secrets about the circle, the oval, the pear shape. Just put them together with a few connecting lines and you can create your own cartoon kingdom. People often ask me where we get ideas for cartoons. My answer is, the whole world is full of ideas. And here are some of our cartoons that started out with a simple idea. As you know, Woody Woodpecker was born when he came tap-tapping on the roof of my cottage in Sherwood Forest. And knock-knock, Woody's very first picture was built around his early morning tapping on the roof. But ideas can come anytime, anywhere. For example, there was a story in the newspaper about Woodpecker's ruining telephone poles. So we produced a cartoon in which Woody almost wrecked the phone company. And the title of this picture is, To Catch a Woodpecker. Naturally, fairy tales are a great source of ideas for us. On one, we started with the story of three wishes and developed it into a film in which an Irish leprechaun in the form of a green woodpecker comes to the United States where he meets Woody and offers our red-headed friend three wishes. Smoked ham, was the result of a ham that was burned when one of our artists had a barbecue. Fairweather Fiends is a twist on the phrase about Fairweather Friends. Destination Meatball was suggested by Destination Moon. Wacky by Baby started out as Rockabye Baby. Then I remember when Davy Crockett was a national hero. One of our animators wore a Crockett hat to work. And before you could say, remember the Alamo, the story of Davy Crewcut was born. Many times ideas start with nothing at all. One fellow comes in and says, what's funny? And the story will develop from there. When an idea is suggested, the story men decide whether it's good and if it lends itself to a lot of funny gags. The idea they're working on now started in just about that way. Paul said, what's new? Dalton said, I saw a circus going up out in the valley this morning. Homer piped up, hey, it might be fun to do a circus show. And Paul said, it might be at that. We haven't done one. There's lots of color and action, and there ought to be plenty of gags. Then they started sparking with ideas. Pretty soon they're working the story out with sketches and words, and even a little acting. Now I'll explain what they're doing. There's a big circus in town. Woody wants to get in, but he hasn't any money. He pretends to be a magician. That way he'll manage to get into the circus, and the fun really starts. So where do ideas come from? They're all around us. All we have to do is look for them and be ready to recognize them. Always keep your eyes and ears open and remember, that anything might be an idea for a cartoon. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. I was just looking at a model chart of one of our newest characters. 
His name is Pepito Chiquito. You see, here in the studio, we're always dreaming up new characters. Naturally, every character we use has his own personality. That's why we make these model charts. Several artists work on the same cartoon, but they must all draw the characters the same way. So they all have identical model charts to guide them. They're prepared by the director before the picture is animated. In creating Pepito, or any other character, the director sketches a quick outline. This is done very lightly to get the general position and feeling of the character. Then a darker pencil is used to make a complete and finished outline. We usually follow the light pencil marks quite closely, but the heavier lines are cleaner and more exact. Next, the personality touches are added. All those little things that make the character a real personality are included in the model chart. This is done by adding lines, shading, or costume. Later on, all the shaded areas you see will be painted in different colors. At this point, we're just concerned with creating a character. Of course, we know everything about Woody so we don't have to prepare model charts for him. That's what you think. <laughs> well, maybe there are a few dark corners in your bird brain that we haven't reached yet. Here are some model charts we've used in our cartoons. Let's take a closer look at them. We made this one for a cartoon called Private Eye Pooch. Besides showing how the character looks from different angles, it shows the relative size of this character alongside of Woody. And here, wait a minute, who did this? <laughs> well, I might have known that pesky woodpecker would think of something. I was just checking a scene in one of our new cartoons. When I flip the drawings, I can see the action taking place. This is important, because Woody and all of his friends have to act naturally, not only in their movements, but also in their emotions. Woody likes to feel he does it all himself, but we do give him a bit of help. For example, when he's happy, the lines around the eyes crinkle, and everything goes up in a smile. When he's sad, it's just the opposite. Everything turns down. Many times he's extremely annoyed, and he shows it. Occasionally, Woody tries to think, and then his head hurts, and he feels miserable. We not only have to worry about Woody's looks, but how he moves. Suppose Woody were hitting a ball. He would start in this position and would end in this one. To establish this, we make a series of drawings from the first position to the final position. After these drawings are photographed, they go through the projector so rapidly that the character actually moves. Over 5,000 drawings are used to make just one of the Woody Woodpecker cartoons you see on this show. Although it takes a lot of sketches to put life in our pesky young redhead, we enjoy making them, and I hope you enjoy watching them. Like all the rest of us, Woody Woodpecker has changed quite a lot over the years. In the early days, Woody was just another woodpecker before we made him what he is today. Who made who? All right, Woody. You've been very helpful. Helpful? If it weren't for me, you'd be selling pencils instead of drawing with them. Okay, okay. There's no use arguing about it, Woody. The fact remains that I did discover Woody many years ago in Sherwood Forest. And we decided he'd make a funny cartoon character. We had a lot of ideas about the way this woodpecker might look, 
And in his first picture, he was much different than he is today. Any of these might have been our red-headed hero in those days, but we finally settled on this one. As you can see, he was more bird-like in those days, and he was real crazy. As time went on, he became a little smoother, and finally Woody has come to look like this. Let's look at some of the ways Woody has changed. You can see he was much goofier, and he had more feathers. Even his hands were like wings. Now let's see what kind of an actor he was in his first picture. As the years went by, Woody changed. His body became rounder and smoother. The feathery look disappeared, except for the collar around his neck. Now we'll see if his acting has improved. His wings became arms, and his hands looked more like human hands. Most of his body was still blue, but his vest changed from red. Today, Woody is even more streamlined. The big change, of course, is the way the top knot curves forward. Now, let's take a look at Woody as he is today. You can see that Woody has gone through many changes since the first day he came to life on our drawing boards. Show him how I'm going to look in the future. Well, I don't know what he means by that, but let's find out. <laughs> how about this, boss? <laughs> Boy, that'll be the day. <laughs> These are a few sketches that one of our directors brought in for approval. Sometimes people think it's rather odd that we have directors for cartoon films. They say, how can you direct an animated character? Because we not only have to plan what they'll do and say, but we also have to create the characters. I think you might be interested in seeing some of the things a cartoon director is responsible for. To start with, we must have a main situation or idea around which to build our story. The director works with the story men to develop this idea. Then they discuss different gags, trying to find as many funny situations as possible. After the story has been pretty well developed, the story man makes a rough storyboard. Both the writer and the director have to be artists because we draw our stories instead of writing them. When the storyboard is finished, the director goes over it with the writer. The writer makes notes about the characters and plans a gag so that they are funny and entertaining. Then the director starts to lay out and time the entire production. He does this on a timing sheet. Everything has to be worked out in advance. The action, the dialogue, the music, and the sound effects. The director marks on his timing sheet the exact length of every scene in the picture, the tempo, and the exact place where sound effects or dialogue are to be used. Now, using the storyboard as a guide, the director makes a series of sketches that will tell the story in action. While he's drawing these action sketches, the director also makes drawings of the stage settings where the action will take place. The settings can be almost anywhere. A desert, a forest, a log cabin. Anything that fits the story and makes an interesting background. Whenever a new character is created for a cartoon, the director makes up a model chart that serves as a guide for the animators to follow. This model chart shows how the character will look from the front, the side, and the rear. It also points out any special features. For example, the character might have a tail that hangs in a special way. All details of clothing or costume are shown on the model charts. In timing the action of his picture, the director uses a metronome. It can be set to give from one to four beats a second. He figures out what beat or tempo he wants the action to follow and makes a note of it on the timing sheet. 
Then he works with the musical director to develop the type and kind of musical score that will fit the action of the picture. Along with everything else, the director meets with the animators who will work on the cartoon. He explains the entire storyboard to them and any special features that have to be considered. The director has a big job and a very important one. He has to be an idea man, a gag man, an artist, have a knowledge of music and many other things. And his work is especially difficult when you think that his star actor is a bird brain named Woody Woodpecker. No doubt all of you who are learning to play the piano or other musical instruments have used the metronome to help you keep the proper tempo. Now a metronome plays a very important part in the making of an animated cartoon. This black box is a special electric metronome. We use it because it's very accurate. The numbers on this dial represent different tempos. The director uses this metronome to time the action for our cartoon. When we want a character to move fast, we time his action to this tempo. When we want him to move slow, we set the dial to a slower tempo. The director times the entire cartoon with this little black box and indicates the tempo on this time sheet. Note how each step is marked. Here the steps are closer together. And here they are farther apart. To demonstrate our little black box more clearly, let's have Woody Woodpecker act out a scene for us. Hey, this is my day off. Why don't you use Wendy? I guess we have been working you pretty hard, Woody. So we'll give the scene to Wendy. Here's Wendy at the start of a scene. Winter has come, and he wants to get to his cabin before the snow flies. The metronome is set at a fast tempo because Wendy is in a hurry. Now watch how he runs to this tempo. We slow down the tempo as Wendy gets tired. Now Wendy is really slowing down. And finally loses all his wind. I don't think the old boy's gonna make it. And so you see how important the metronome is? For example, here is Wally Walrus conducting the orchestra at a slow tempo. Now, we go into a medium tempo. Wally Wallace now decides on a very fast tempo. Every scene in our cartoons is timed to the tempo we set on this little black box. 
I guess it's no secret that my favorite cartoon character is Woody Woodpecker. Usually he's dashing around cooking up mischief, but it isn't all his fault because he couldn't get around at all without our help. Maybe you'd like to see how we do it. The artist who makes Woody move is known as an animator. His job requires a lot of talent and many years of experience. He works at this special drawing board. There's a round metal plate with glass in the center that can be moved to any position you want. And underneath is a light that shines up through the paper that the animator works on. There are two sets of pegs on the board, and the paper the animator uses is punched so that it fits right over these pegs. In order to have a cartoon character move, the animator must make a series of drawings to show that action. To do this, the animator places a sheet of paper on the pegs, then draws the first position of the character. He then puts another sheet on the pegs. The first drawing acts as a guide in drawing the second position of the arm. It requires 12 drawings to raise the arm slowly. When he has completed a series of drawings, the animator can flip them to see the action. To get the action on film, we photograph each drawing separately. This is the result. Each one of these little squares or frames has a picture of one drawing on it. I know this is too small for you to see the pictures, so we made a large photograph of it. These are the individual pictures of drawings, and when they move real fast through the projector, we see the action. Now let's see how that action looks after it's been put on film. As you can see, there's a lot of work in bringing cartoon characters to life. As a matter of fact, there's much more to the animator's job than I've been able to show you. But I'll tell you more about it on another one of our shows. These drawings have just been completed by some of the animators here at the Walter Land Studios. It looks like a very interesting sequence. But now we have to put some life in it. This is the camera room where that magic action takes place. This is the test camera. And over here is the production camera. Right now, let's look at the test camera. Our test camera is operated by Mickey Batchelder. The camera lens points down at the tabletop where Mickey places the drawings. The drawings are put on pegs. There's a glass plate in front of the cameraman. And when he steps on the foot pedal, the plate comes down to hold the drawing in place. Then he presses a button, and the camera takes a picture of the drawing. He photographs one drawing at a time. A little later on this show, we'll show that scene come to life. The cameraman always works from an exposure sheet. Like a movie script, it explains the action and shows in what order each drawing is to be photographed. On every shot, our cameraman uses an air hose to clean the dust off of the glass plate. If he didn't do this, every speck of dust would show up on the screen. And the picture would look like this. We call it a snowstorm and we certainly don't want this on our films. We get side movements by moving the background behind the character. He takes a picture with the camera, then turns the handle again, moving the background behind the character, and takes another picture. The 
speed of the action depends on how far he turns the handle before he takes another picture. This is how it appears on the screen. The long shot and close-up action is done by moving the camera up or down, as you see Mickey doing here. In other words, when the camera is lowered, we get closer to the picture. When it is raised, we get farther away. Here's how it looks on the screen. You've probably noticed that the drawings Mickey is photographing are outlines only. That's because this is a rehearsal of the cartoon. We want to make sure that all the action is perfect before we get the drawings ready for the final photography on the production camera. It's slow work photographing a test reel of all the drawings that are needed for a complete cartoon, but finally it's done and ready for us to look at. I'd like to show you part of a test reel that is ready for approval. Lights out, Woody. Thanks, Woody. Now all the drawings go to the inking and painting departments to be finished. On one of these programs, we'll show you how these pencil drawings are completed by inking and painting. Hi there. I guess by this time, you recognize this as a storyboard for one of our Woody Woodpecker cartoons. Of course, the storyboard is just a rough idea of what the finished picture will be like. It's a series of drawings that have to be brought to life. Oh, uh, that shouldn't be hard. Oh, maybe it shouldn't, Woody, but it's a lot of work. After the director has timed his picture, he goes over the storyboard with the animators who will work on it. He explains the story in detail and the personality of the characters. Then he gives each animator a portion of the story to animate. This is what they have to work with. The storyboard tells a story. The model chart shows special features of the characters. The layout is a drawing of the stage setting in which the action takes place. The exposure sheet gives us a complete description of everything we're supposed to see and hear. On this one, the scene opens with Woody in a chair. The kids come in and the little girl says, Uncle Woody, tell us a story. It takes one, two, three, four, ten drawings for the word uncle. Then Woody starts here and ends here. Tell us a story. And so on. When the animator starts to bring the story to life, he puts the layout drawing on the top pegs of the drawing board and the character drawings on the bottom pegs. That's so the background can be moved to give the impression that the figure is moving. When the first drawing is finished, the animator places a second sheet of paper on the pegs and makes his second drawing. By flipping the drawing as he works, the animator can tell whether the action from one drawing to the next will be smooth. The faster he flips, the faster the action becomes. If two characters are working in the same scene, they're often drawn on separate sheets of paper.
The animator actually makes only the key drawings in a scene. For example, if not head and splinter are walking, the animator would draw them in the starting position and at the end of the walk. He would indicate the number of drawings he wanted in between. Then he turns his key drawings over to his assistant to complete. When the drawings are completed, the animator flips through them to determine whether the action moves smoothly. When the animator is satisfied with the drawings, they're checked by the director before going to the camera department. On one of these shows, we'll follow along and see what happens to them there. You know, to travel anywhere, we humans have to have tickets, but not Woody. Woody's ticket is just an idea in a writer's head. Wherever the writer wants to send Woody, we can get him there. This will give you an idea of the strange places Woody has visited. We sent him to Alaska. When it was too cold. To a jungle near the equator. When it was too hot. We even sent him out of this world in a spaceship. Where it was too lonely. And once we took him to a razzle-dazzle circus. Now there's a place that's just right. Woody's travel start here with the director and the background artist. Alex Lobey, the director, and Ray Jacobs, the background artist, are planning the backgrounds for one of Woody's adventures. The background artist goes to work on what we call a layout sketch. He works from the storyboard, but he makes his drawings more complete with greater detail. He draws both the interior and exterior backgrounds. He tries to keep them clear and simple so they can be recognized easily. That's because Woody's pictures are shown in 72 different countries around the world. When he needs information about a particular location, he may ask for help from the library. But that's where we keep books and magazine pictures of costumes and places like the Eiffel Tower, the Pyramids, or the beach of Waikiki. Lowell Elliott, who is in charge of our library, brings some illustrations for Ray to look at. When the layouts are finished, a director uses them to set the stage for the actions of Woody. Then the animators draw the actions of the characters on sheets of paper placed over the layout. Now the backgrounds have to be painted in full color. This is done very carefully, for we don't want the background to clash with the colors of the characters. The different colors used on the characters are marked on the model sheet. A color chart is used to select the right color and shade. We certainly wouldn't have Woody standing in front of a barn painted the same shade of red as our wacky hero. You can say that again. Where are you, Woody? Right here, boss. When all the backgrounds are completed, they go to the camera department. They're placed on pegs. Then the characters are placed over the background and the picture is photographed. And Woody is off on more adventures that may take place anywhere in the world, even though he really never leaves the Wonderland studio. I've often thought what fun it would be if we could just dream about where we wanted to go. Then draw a picture of that place and put ourselves into it. Unfortunately, it isn't that easy for us. That's where Woody has a big advantage. I know you've all heard voices played on records. In the studio, we have a different way of reproducing voices and sounds. 
Let me show him how to do it, boss. Okay, Woody. Go ahead. <laughs> Whenever Woody gives that crazy laugh, the sound is recorded on a strip of film. Suppose we run it on the moviola so you can really see what it looks like. Now the film is going through the moviola, and the jiggly lines you see are the sounds that Woody was making. Let's look at it again. And this time, we'll throw on the sound switch to hear how it sounds. Guess who? <laughs> Voices are always recorded first. Because we must know how long it takes a character to say a word before we can draw the action that fits the word. For example, if Woody's laugh is two seconds long, we'll have to draw 48 pictures to show Woody laughing. After the laugh is recorded, the film goes to our cutting department, where Gene runs it through the moviola. Gene marks where the laugh starts and where it stops. He uses a soft grease pencil which doesn't scratch the film and can easily be rubbed off. Then the film is run through the moviola very slowly while every letter in the sound is printed. The next step is to run the film through a cotter. The counter shows just how many frames or pictures it takes for each letter that was marked on the film. Then Gene writes the letters of the laugh on a timing slip. This gives the director the information he needs to plan the action for all the scenes where there are laughs or voices. And that's how Woody actually gives his famous laugh whenever you hear him sound off. Let's hear it again, Woody, old boy. These are a few finished drawings that we just made for one of our cartoons. It takes thousands of drawings like these to complete one short cartoon film. First, we transfer these pencil drawings to a cell. This is a cell. Here's Donna, the head of our inking department at work. She places a cell over the drawing and carefully copies the drawing onto the cell with pen and ink. At the same time, other inkers are working on different scenes. All the inkers are artists. Notice the black stick in the inker's hand. It's called an ebony stick, and it's used to hold the cell steady so it can be worked on more easily. Have you noticed those air-conditioned gloves the girls are wearing? Well, they wear them to keep their hands from marking the cells. Once in a while, one of the girls may make a mistake. Then she uses a felt stick to erase. The felt stick will take away any line without scratching the smooth surface of the cell. After the cell is inked, it's put with other cells, all ready for the painters to add the finishing colors. Here's what Woody looks like before we give him his fine coat of feathers. These ink lines are on one side of the cell, and he is painted in color on the reverse side of the cell before it's photographed. I'll tell you why that's done when we visit the painting department on another show. I wonder if you recognize this fuzzy looking picture. Take a good look at it. This is the way many of our people here at Walterland Studios see Woody and his friends every day. If I turn it over, I'm sure you'll recognize our wacky hero in person. This is a painted cell, which is a drawing in color on a clear piece of celluloid. Before we make these drawings, the cells are like little windows. You can see right through them. That's why we use them. Here we have a background. It's the stage setting for our action. Then this painted cell fits right over the top of it. And you can still see the background behind the character. If we want another character, 
All we have to do is add another cell. Now you see both characters against the same background. For every picture, we make color model charts. For example, here's one we've used, and you can see how all the colors have been marked. The colors are chosen from a chart that includes all the colors and different shades that we know will give us the best results. The paints for our cells are specially mixed to match our color charts. We mix enough paint at the beginning of a picture so that colors will not change throughout the picture. Every painter has all the colors she needs in little jars on her desk. She works with a glass plate that has a light under it. This helps her to see the drawing more clearly. I'm sure you've already noticed that she turned the cell over to work on the back of it. That way she can flow the paint right up to the ink line. After a cell is finished and the paint has completely dried, the painter cleans it with a damp cloth. She makes sure that it has no fingerprints or paint splatters on it. It has to be a perfect cell before it leaves the painting department. From the painting department, the cells go to the camera department to be photographed into the finished film. So now you know how we paint our cells and why the painting is always done on the back. This is a special job we're working on here at the studio. It's going to be a brand new drawing book. We produce many of these to help young people learn to draw. Here are some of the drawings that go into the book. We try to keep them as simple as possible because when you clutter up a drawing with too many lines, it just doesn't look good. We draw just enough lines to make the character come to life. Let me show you a few things to remember in drawing. In the first place, you use a soft pencil. And do not hold it too tightly and draw loosely. Usually when you're just learning to draw, you do it this way. You make your lines too carefully and you press down too hard. Now let's see one of our studio artists at work. See how smoothly he works. First he sketches out the general outline of the figure and then fills in the details later. Here's a picture of Woody that will be in the book. On one of our programs, I showed you how we draw this red-headed rascal. Do you remember how we did it? First we draw a circle and put two ovals inside it. Two lines make the bill. Then we put in the eyes, the eyebrows, and the mouth. The next thing is to add the top knot, then the neck. Now the body is made as a simple outline. All we have to do now is to put in a few details to give Woody his familiar personality. And there he is, ready for action. Not bad, boss. Not bad. He wouldn't be satisfied no matter how perfect we made him. Now how about a quick trip around the studio to see what the other artists are doing? This artist is working on a drawing of our friend, Wally Walrus. Now let's move along to Paul's drawing board. It looks as though he's getting chilly willy into some sort of predicament. I hope you saw how freely the artists make their sketches. Most of our drawings are done with circles or ovals and a few connecting lines. That way the characters look better and can be animated more easily. 
we always draw Woody and his friends in very natural poses. Another thing, we always draw the character's head larger than normal. This adds to his personality and his expressions. Look at that conceited woodpecker. I'll bet you never realize that all animated cartoon characters have only three fingers and a thumb. Why? I don't know. But it certainly doesn't bother Andy Panda. Here's a drawing of Woody's nephew, Knothead. I'll show you a trick to change his character. I'll erase the top knot. Then flip it back this way. Add a hair ribbon to make a ponytail. Add a skirt and it's not head sister, Splinter. These are only a few of the characters in the drawing book. Here are some of the others. Homer Pigeon, Oswald Rabbit, Winnie Woodpecker, Charlie Chicken, and all the rest of your cartoon friends. I guess you can see we get a lot of fun out of preparing a drawing book like this. And I hope you'll get a lot of fun out of drawing and coloring your favorite cartoon characters. One of the many important things in making cartoon films is the variety of sound effects we use. These sound effects are put in after all the drawings are completed. They play a very important part in giving the story a feeling of life and action. Let me show you what I mean. Lights out, Woody. Okay, boss. Thanks, Woody. See how much we miss by not hearing sounds? Sound effects are indicated on the timing sheet by the director when he's planning a picture. Sometimes he may know exactly what he wants, and he marks it down. But other times, he may just put in some odd word to guide the sound man. Maybe it's a word like this. Spring. Or perhaps kachung. Or in other spots, it might be zip. Or splat. Then it's up to our sound men to find the sound effects that will fit the action and the director's ideas. Sometimes we create new sound effects, and you might have fun trying these tricks. By crumpling cellophane, we get the crackling of a fire, the sound of a horse galloping is made with coconut shells, A balloon might give us squeaky sounds for doors or shoes. A pistol shot could be made by hitting a pad or a cushion with a stick. And slide whistles come in handy for many situations. Today, nearly all of our sound effects are on film. When a script calls for gunshots, running horses, or any sound you can think of, Gene looks in his index file to see what sounds he has in his library. He selects the film that has the sound he's looking for. Then he goes through the entire script and picks out the best sound effect for the action in the cartoon. When all the sound effects have been selected, he runs them on his moviola with the cartoon to see if the sound effects match the action. <laughs> now 
Now, just to show you what a different sound effects make, I'm going to rerun the film I just showed you a little while ago. Lights out, Woody. Thanks, Woody. You see how the sound effects make the action more interesting? They sure do. Every motion picture that is filmed must have a story or a script, but here's the kind of script we use in making cartoons. It's called a storyboard. It looks like a comic strip in your Sunday paper. The idea for this cartoon came from a newspaper. It's a true story about woodpeckers wrecking telephone poles and causing much damage. And here is Homer Brightman to give you our version of the same story. The idea of this story is built around a problem in the telephone company. We start with a title to catch a woodpecker. Then we fade in on the front door of the telephone building. It's a very elaborate marble building. We cut into a closer shot of a brass plate which reads, Miracle Telephone Company. If you get your call, it's a miracle. Then we show the building itself, which is shaped like a telephone. And then we dissolve into the office of the president through the front door. And he is sitting at a <clears throat> very elaborate desk. The phone rings, ring, ring, ring. And he answers the phone. He says, hello. When you hear, burp, burp, and then, rah, rah, rah. And he makes a big take, and he puts, slams the receiver down. He says, it's that crazy woodpecker again. He turns around, and he jumps away from the desk and goes, Phew. And you cut down to the floor, and we see he's a very pompous little man. He walks over to a map of the city on the wall. And on the map, there's a light right, that's blinking. It's going, da 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 And we cut into a closer shot, and it builds up. The woodpecker's voice is getting louder. Blah, da, blah, da. And he reacts. He says, that's all Houlihan's territory. He whirls around, and he grabs the intercom and jams his head right through with a crash. He says, send the Houlihan up here. And this guy skids right into a stop. And he comes to attention, and he says, Oh, hula hand, reporting, sir. Oh, hula hand, that woodpecker's drilling holes in our telephone poles again. He's costing us thousands of dollars. Now, you either get rid of him, or I'll get rid of you! Oh, do you there? And he goes, Shh, the digging running out. We dissolve to a very sad, dismal scene of telephone poles hacked to pieces. We come into a closer shot of a, one of these poles and the little pieces that have been hacked off go bloop, 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 down out of the scene. We cut to another telephone pole and we see Woody's on it and he's drilling. When this hand comes in and taps him on the tail feathers, he turns around and we cut back and see that it's a hula hand and he has him by the neck. He says, sure, I'm getting rid of you, woodpecker, me boy. And he drops him in the sack and ties a knot in the sack and goes, scram. And he dusts off his hands and slides right down the old telephone pole. <whistles> and Woody's waiting at the bottom with a pin in his hand. And he goes into the pin and he goes, Whoa! right up and crack. His old head hits the top of that bar. Then we dissolve again. And he doesn't give up. He's a determined character. He comes in with a rope and a lasso in it and goes, <whistles> he throws up over the top of the telephone pole and it goes right over Woody. Woody just takes it off, puts it over the top of the telephone pole, and you hear, this thing's grinding, and it's being pulled down off scene, squeak. And you cut down the troubleshooter's wagon, you see old Houlihan standing there with his old hand on his hip, and he's winding us in on a winch. And Woody's coming down and down and down into the scene, closer and closer, and finally comes right into old Houlihan. Thank you, Homer. That's just part of the story but it will give you an idea of how a storyboard is used in making cartoons. There's still a lot of work to be done by directors, artists, musicians, and cameramen. And I'll show you what they do on some of our other shows. What's the matter, boss? Oh, I'm just working on a new character. Let's see it. There you are. What do you think of him? 
Not bad. But he'll never replace good old Woody Woodpecker. Oh, no? One of these days, we're going to develop a character that'll put you back in the woods where you belong. <laughs> I'm afraid that rascal's right this time. But we never know when a new character will come along and be a big success. Most of the characters come out of the story itself. The writer prepares a story that includes different types. We know from the story whether the character is big or little, mean or kind, and we create a character to fit the part. That's how Pepito Chiquito was created. The writer was interested in calypso music, so he wrote a story about Trinidad, and Pepito just naturally fitted the part. Another time, a writer had a story called Salmon Yeggs. In the story, there was a night watchman, an odd little guy, who didn't seem too sharp. But every time anyone tried to break into the warehouse he was guarding, he was Johnny on the spot. This is the way he turned out. And he did such a wonderful job that we'll probably use him in other cartoons. Then there was Dooley. In his first picture, he was a bank robber with stubbly whiskers and a gravelly voice. Dooley did such a bang-up job in that cartoon that we gave him the part of Captain Dooley in Dopey Dick. Our audience liked him so well that we put him in the misguided missile as Dapper Denver Dooley. O'Hulahan was another character who won a chance for a repeat appearance. In the cartoon, To Catch a Woodpecker, he was a telephone repairman. Later he came back in another picture as an Irish policeman and a fine figure of an officer he was. Then we made a cartoon where Woody was taking a rocket to the moon. Boy, what a job that was. We needed a European scientist to design the rocket. That's when the professor joined our cast of characters. One of our newest characters is Windy Bear, a real blowhard. A small fellow beside him is his son. Here is a story about bears in Yellowstone Park. It's called Father and son. Homer, how about explaining a little of the story, boy? Fine, Walter. Our story opens in Yellowstone Park. All the geysers are in action going... <laughs> a ranger walks in and puts down the sign, chonk. The sign reads, warning, do not feed the bears. Wendy and his son peek out from behind a bush and see the sign. They walk over to it, and read it. Wendy is real indignant. Warning! Do not feed the bears. Phooey! What are they trying to do, son? Starve us poor bears? His son says, oh, well, Pop, we could eat berries. Berries? Ugh. Berries are for the birds, son. Then he looks off up the road and he sees the tourist coming. Hmm. There's our free meal ticket, son. He sizes him up. He says, you just watch your Pop. And he goes into his act. Well, Wendy made such a hit in Father and Son that we have several more cartoons planned for him. I think he's going to be a great big Wendy success. We create these characters to give you entertainment and laughs. When you let us know that you like them, we put them in other cartoons and hope they'll turn out to be as big stars as Woody Woodpecker. <laughs>